All right, so the star-nosed mole hasn't gone anywhere yet. It still exists in our lives, and so we shall continue. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Darwin, and Darwin's a player in this idea of evolution and natural selection, okay? I, and that is not to be undersold. Now, look at these two turtles, these tortoises, right? So this tur tortoise has longer legs, and you see how since its shell goes up, it can get its neck up higher? This tortoise could eat taller leaves than this tortoise. It's got shorter legs, and uh, there's a shell in the way. So this tortoise adapted to an environment that's different from this one. I mean, look at the dirt. Look, look at the ground here. There's, there's nice little vegetation low. This sucker is like in the desert. So um, it is an example of some of the variations, some of the differences that Darwin noticed amongst these organisms. He noticed this in, in tortoises and in, and in birds, finches in particular. And what he noticed was like the beak of the finches was different. Some finches had really big, thick, heavy beaks. And some of them had these like needle nose, very, very thin, precise beaks. And he's like, well, why do they do that? Why do these things have some precise and some not precise? And so what he started thinking was uh, that each structure, each thing that these organisms had was an, a change that that organism experienced because of the environment they lived in, right? And the idea would be an adaptation. It would be a genetic change in a population that generally uh, leads to a better outcome for that organism. If this bird eats insects, you don't want a big, thick, heavy beak trying to eat an insect. The insect will climb in and out of your beak and you'll never get to it. But if it's very precise, very thin, very small, and very quick, well, that might be better for what it is you're trying to do. Furthermore, uh, uh, if you're trying to eat big, heavy uh, seeds, maybe a big, thicker beak in that sense would be better. These are adaptations. Please take out of your head the idea I had, like, that when you live somewhere cold, you adapt to the cold weather. That's not what you're doing. An adaptation is a genetic change in a population. So unless you become a mutant from cold weather, which no one does, you're not adapting, right? You get used to the discomfort of cold, maybe, but that's about it. So uh, Darwin also found fossils of living organisms, sorry, found fossils of extinct organisms that look like living organisms. Like he'd find something that looks like this, and he's like, wait a minute, that looks a lot like this or something like that, right? So he'll find fossils of something that's no longer there and be like, this looks just like this thing that still exists right now. And he thought that was very strange. He's like, well, why, what is it about this organism that it didn't make it? And what is it about this other organism that it did? And he also found something that is hard to explain, seashells, like ocean shells on top of the Andes Mountains. Now, we're not saying like a couple of shells here, right? He found lots and lots and lots of shells on top of the Andes Mountain. And the question then became, well, how does a shell end up on the top of the Andes Mountain? And the answer had to be, or at least the best theory had to be, that that part of the Andes Mountain used to be underwater. And now it's not. Uh, he saw some land move underwater because of earthquakes. Uh, and he tried to put all this together. And to be fair, Darwin had a hard time putting this all together. He got a lot of help. Uh, we, we give Darwin maybe more credit than, than he deserves. There was a lot of people that played a role in this. But not to, but the, the one to mention is Alfred Wallace, who really came through for Darwin and helped him understand how to put all this together. But... Uh, we will go further into that as we look into more of evolution. And that's it for section two.